Okay, welcome back to Coast to Coast. Michael Murphy, multi-award winning producer, director, political activist, president of the Coalition Against Geoengineering. As an independent reporter and community organizer, his work includes directing and co-producing that groundbreaking documentary, Why in the World Are They Spraying? And the documentary, What in the World Are They Spraying? It has awakened millions of people to environmental threats and agendas of global engineering programs. And here he is now as we talk about unconventional shade of gray, or what is it, unconventional gray? Whatever it is, you've done it again. We've, uh, we've changed the name from unconventional shade of gray to unconventional gray, but thanks, you know, for having me on again and for covering this. Such an important issue. Oh, my gosh, Michael, it really is. Now, when you came out with the other two documentaries, Why in the World Are They Spraying and What in the World, what kind of reaction did you get then? Oh my God! It was uh, uh, overwhelming the the attention, and we uh, I think we we're the first people to really bring some credible information in, into the issue. So uh, it was very overwhelming uh, at first, um, but it did wake up millions of people around the world, and I think it was responsible at least in partly for forming the movement that we now have. And as a result, people around the world are now addressing this. They're looking for ways to stop it. Um, so that's really what is, I guess, aiming us and, and our professional team into the third film. This is going to be my final film uh, on the issue, but I believe it's going to be the catalyst finally for stopping these programs. We have a very uh, well thought out strategy, um, a very uh, professional team moving forward. And this is a call to action film. So. Uh, it's been a lot of work, but I'm very confident that it will uh, be the catalyst to stopping these programs. So I'm very excited. Oh, well, let's hope so. Michael, 10 years ago, when you would talk about chemical uh, chemtrails, uh, geoengineering, what would people generally say? Did they think we were all crazy? <laughs> yeah, and, and I think we thought that we were crazy. I mean, back, God, 10 years ago, uh, it, it was such a taboo topic. And even, you know, even five years ago when we came out with uh, What in the World Are They Spraying, it was very, uh, not very well known. Um, after the film, it started breaking the ice, but still people kind of kind of looked at this as, as something that was considered this conspiratorial issue. Well, here we are six years later, and most people are at least aware that there's an issue out there. Some believe it, some don't, but uh, God, the 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 market, if you would, has changed dramatically over that five-year period. And today people are listening. Today people are questioning. And if you live in Los Angeles, um, our skies have just been uh, heavily aerosol. And, and they've mm -hmm. changed dramatically, oh, sure. even even in the past five years. So, so these programs continue to ramp up. Uh, while we have credible information out there, I think that we've made a lot of progress, at least in terms of awakening people, now my goals are looking at this awakening, which we have had a mass awakening, and really focusing on what we can do to stop these programs. And, you know, I look back and, and with both of the films, which I think were successful in terms of waking people up, but our skies are still filled uh, with aerosols. We still have the, the related climate change. And uh, I've come to the realization that probably... Uh, even though it's important to wake people up and to get the word out, it's not enough. We have to do more to get these programs stopped. So that's really uh, what I've been brainstorming about for the past several, oh, God, a couple of years. And now we have a very, uh, as I said, a very well thought out strategy. And I feel very strongly that we have the right ingredients um, that will put an end to these programs. Michael, how do you convince people who will say, Look, you folks, you're just looking at jet vapors. That's it. How do you how do you get them convinced that there's some geoengineering going on up there? These are chemtrails too, uh, right? And and we do run by that a little bit. The the uh, it's changed a lot, obviously, in the past five years. People are starting to question. But uh, you know, the films, both what and why in the world are they spraying? Uh, go to why in the world are they spraying dot com. They're valuable tools, and we made those available on YouTube, and that was to create the worldwide movement. So, uh, you know, right now people are questioning, some people are skeptical, but with the facts that we have in terms of uh, geoengineers' plans and proposals and the changes that we're seeing in terms of agriculture, uh, ozone destruction, uh, pH changes in the soil, all of these things match what the consequences 
uh, would be, according to geoengineers, if they were to start these programs. Well, they have started these programs. We have so much evidence. And really, you know, I try to relate to people because I was at in that place. Um, and the first person that told me about this, I literally thought they were crazy and didn't wasn't really open to the issue. It was only after several years living in Arizona, I noticed that our skies were changing. I began to question that. And then again, somebody told me about the issue, which they called chemtrails uh, at the time. So my eyes uh, began to be open, uh, opened up just due to what we were seeing in terms of atmospheric conditions. But then, you know, I, I researched this quite a bit, looking into the issue of geoengineering and came to the realization that there's no question about it. These programs have been ongoing. Uh, actually, now we're finding for well over 40 years, um, and they're very destructive both to human health and ecosystems uh, around the world. So many people now are noticing that forests are collapsing. I spent the summer in Chicago, and they've had an abundance, just an abundance of rain over the past couple of years, and I would say about 20% of the trees are dead. They're Jeez. dying. In that area, and I, of course, I've traveled uh, all around the world, uh, live sometimes in Hawaii where we're getting an abundance of rain. Same thing around the world. Our, our ecosystems are collapsing. Trees are dying. And, of course, what we addressed in both of the two previous films, the aluminum, and that's the primary ingredient that they're spraying, and other things as well, which uh, hopefully we'll get into, those are very toxic to uh, to soils, to ecosystems. As a result, the pH has been changing, uh, sometimes in certain areas, up to 10 times the alkalinity. Uh, as a result of those changes, due to the metals that they're putting into our sky, uh, we're getting these ecosystem collapses. We're getting uh, forest collapsing. But as we've spoken about in other shows, there's a company called Arbigen uh, that's genetically modifying uh, forest. So mm -hmm. <laughs> the trees die. Corporate America, or should I say the genetically modified uh, companies are there to, quote-unquote, save the day. But it certainly appears it's the uh, old Hegelian dialectic, the problem-reaction-solution. Uh, of course, that's going into the hands of corporations taking over our natural systems. Have you been able to find pilots, Michael, who will testify what they're doing? Not yet. Not yet. That is, and, that's that's the, the big goal for all of us, isn't it? We, You know what? We, we thought about that, but these our top secret programs, and there are a lot of consequences for testifying. So some people have come up and they've, they've stated that they were part of, the, uh, part of the programs, but they didn't sound credible, and I think it's, it's very important to make sure somebody is uh, credentialed and they're telling the truth. What we've decided to do, George, because we don't have too many whistleblowers, at least ones that appear to be credible, we're taking airplanes up, and we've started – uh, an aerosol collection project. So we have a team of pilots. We have uh, Dr. J. Marvin Herndon, who's going to be overseeing the project. He's a world-renowned scientist. We're going up into the trails uh, with our own airplanes, and we're testing the aerosol trails. And uh, that is going to conclusively prove that geoengineering is occurring and is changing our climate. And with that, we have, with a peer-reviewed paper that doc Dr. Herndon uh, is planning on writing, we have court admissible evidence that we can bring in into courts, and we have a very clear and concise uh, game plan with what we're going to be doing. But, you know, for years we've had rain tests, and the rain tests that we have uh, in terms of ingredients, they match what geoengineers state they want to put up into our sky but deny that they're doing it. Uh, the metals match a number of geoengineering patents uh, designed to spray such as uh, metals like aluminum oxide uh, into our sky, and what we see in, in the sky, especially here in Los Angeles, on just a, about a day-to-day -day basis, these long trails that do not dissipate, they actually spread out, blocking our sun. They did decrease the temperature, uh, at least for a short time. Uh, those are what geoengineers state they urgently want to do. So with that, with these fingerprints, uh, if you would, that we're finding all around the world, this is not just limited to Los Angeles, we're finding uh, rain tests with thousands of times the normal amounts of aluminum all around the world now. And because of that and because of the thousands of other dots that connect, there's no question that these programs are in full-scale deployment. So uh, right now I think we're in a critical time, but I think we're in a very uh, powerful time in terms of the work that we're doing because uh, our back is against the wall right now. 
but we're finally starting to get the support to get the airplanes in the sky uh, to bring forth this court admissible evidence. Um, and a lot of people say, well, our court system is, uh, is not valid, you know, it's bogus. And, and I would agree with people uh, on many fronts with that, but we have to realize these are global programs. And while the United States might be in favor of doing this, there are winners and losers, uh, especially according to uh, David Keith, geoengineer David Keith and Ken Caldera, certain regions lose. And we have to remember this is a global issue. So we're addressing this uh, in a global capacity. And what we're doing is uh, sticking up for the countries that lose and all of humanity. So it's really a, it's a humanitarian effort, um, I believe, and I think that we're at that point where we've crossed or maybe we're right around the tipping point. And because of that, we're starting to get attention. We're starting to get recognized. Um, regions have lost crops. They have lost uh, many things. There have been a lot of damages due to the droughts, the floods that geoengineering uh, is creating. And because of that, we're in a very critical time because we just had COP21, the uh, France Climate Agreement, mm -hmm. uh, which was a uh, partially legally binding agreement. And what these do, which I'd like to get into uh, in detail, what the goal is, it's to legalize geoengineering, at least create the framework to legalize geoengineering. So this is a huge consolidation of power. So that means they know it's illegal. <laughs> oh, they absolutely do. Yeah. And, uh, George, the, the question a lot of people have, they said, people tell me they're spraying right now. They don't care if it's legal or not. And that's a lie. They definitely need to legalize these programs because today we can take both legal and legislative action to stop these programs. And again, not only here in the United States, but around the world. And because of that, uh, there are a lot of damages that have been created, again, due to droughts, due to floods, and then the contamination, people dying from aluminum-related illnesses. So I think it's very important for them to uh, take the legislative steps, which they appear to be doing, to legalize this. And what the goal is, it's to take this out of the United States and other countries' jurisdiction, form global governance. This is, I'm talking about the climate agreements and uh, really uh, remove our ability and our legislators' ability for that uh, matter to take uh, effective action. And it does. It takes – once global governance is formed and once it's taken out of uh, jurisdictions of countries around the world, legislators that had an opportunity to represent their constituents, uh, they're, they're losing that ability. So they're losing power. Uh, and, again, they're not going to be able to – and we're moving very quickly – into that point to be able to, again, uh, uh, legislate. Michael, when we come back, we're going to talk specifically now about the new documentary on conventional gray. And then why are they spraying? That's the big question. Hey, welcome back to Coast to Coast. Our special guest, Michael Murphy. He'll be uh, around for phone calls next hour. Michael, tell us about unconventional gray. Unconventional gray, it's, it's a call to action uh, film. And we really looked at the past two films, and we were successful in terms of bringing this message out to people, but there has to be more that we have to do. So that really was, uh, there's a need in, in the movement right now, and it's to really get active, because as we're talking about these uh, climate agreements and the TPP and other uh, agreements, what they're geared to do is to create global governance. And what geoengineering is doing, it's creating climate change. Geoengineering programs are designed to manipulate our weather, and they're designed to change the temperature of our planet. And because of this, they're creating a huge amount of our changing climate. And everything, of course, that we see in terms of droughts, in terms of temperature fluctuations, whether it's a jet stream or, uh, you know, different storms coming in, it's being blamed on, on CO2. And based on what we've researched and from the mouths of geoengineers, these programs change our climate. And what we have to look at right now, global governance is being formed. We have the largest transfer of monetary and political power in the history of our planet, all uh, being uh, determined based on climate models that are sourcing CO2 is the cause of our, cha uh, our changing climate. Now, uh, a lot of people uh, argue. Um, they argue whether the planet's warming or cooling. We don't do that. Our stance is very strong. It is literally impossible 
to determine what the planet's doing based on the fact that we've had geoengineering for well over 40 years. And because of that, we are looking at ways to stop the uh, various forms of legislation uh, and mandates and everything else that they're moving forward with, which, by the way, is a multi-trillion dollar transfer of, uh, of wealth. It's, it's a huge uh, percentage of power, huge uh, amounts of money. And we're not, again, arguing whether the planet's warming or cooling, but we definitely have a major problem in relation uh, to geoengineering. So what we're doing, we're demanding uh, through court actions, which I'd like to get into detail, that all climate change mandates, legislation, uh, taxes are immediately stopped and rescinded until our skies are clear of geoengineering programs so that we have nothing detectable. And why this is important, it's literally a message of unity. Uh, because, again, we don't argue whether the planet's warming or cooling, but what we are asking people to do is come together, take a second look at this, recognize that the climate models are flawed, they're missing the, the biggest factor in, geo in, in, uh, in the climate change argument, and that's geoengineering. And because of that, the climate models are flawed, and you cannot move forward with taxation, uh, with removing states' national boundaries. You cannot uh, circumvent constitutions and state laws, and those are the things that are going on. So we're asking people to come together, and we're uh, going into court, and our goals are to get literally go in and, uh, and get injunctions to stop this transfer of power to go through, uh, not permanently, even though we feel it might be permanently, until our skies clear up. And what that does, again, it's a message of unity. It brings both sides of the global warming issue uh, into our court where we're all demanding that geoengineering sure. is stopped. And because of that, uh, we will begin to, once we're successful, which we will be, we'll begin to see our skies clear up. We'll be, begin to see, see our forests rebound. We will begin to see uh, people that, that have a hope for our future. And that's really what our goals and objectives are. So while we're also educating people about what geoengineering is, how it's changing our weather, and how it's literally changing our climate, we also have very strong uh, political objectives, and, and we feel very strongly because of the season that we're in, just legally and legislatively, that this is the only action uh, that we can take uh, to stop these programs. And I'll tell you why. If we ignore, if we don't look at the legal and legislative steps uh, that are occurring and we just hand out information, and which I'm guilty of, and I, I think it's very important, then we will allow this new government, the IPCC, uh, the United Nations to literally circumvent uh, state laws. And they will. The goal is to legalize geoengineering without our input and without the input. Oh, if they can get away with it, they will, Michael. You know that. Yes, ab absolutely. So we have to take action in stopping the climate change agenda that will legalize geoengineering. And we feel very strongly about this. So I have a legal team, uh, and we're moving forward. You can actually find more information at Unconventional Gray. Uh, dot com about our legal steps and our legal initiatives, but this is looking at geoengineering in relation to the climate change agenda. And, and again, I think we've had powerful corporations, powerful interests that have gone into court, and they don't want the climate change agenda because a lot of corporations lose. Um, certain people do, though, because again, it's, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry. It's a whole new green industry. It's a way to form global governance. It's a way to tax people in their homes. I mean, this goes really, really deep. So there are certain interests, again, that really want to see the transfer of power. But there are losers within this. There are people that, that might lose their companies. There are people that, that are definitely damaged. And, and also regions, you know, certain regions, certain regions that signed on to uh, the COP21, the, the uh, recent Paris-France climate agreement, you know, I think some of them lose. But it's a very, I think their backs are against the wall. So what we're looking to do is get, getting support from both sides. And I know it sounds very, very far off. It's literally a David and Goliath. Well, but, but you've got to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere in bottom line. These programs are destroying ecosystems around the world. And, and let me ask you this, Michael. What do you think they're trying to do? I mean, was their original intent good, or what are they doing? Well, ge geoengineering is being sold as a way to mitigate global warming. However... <laughs> Global warming was determined after geoengineering programs have started. We found research, you know, going back and that uh, data that shows that these programs have been ongoing since uh, the 50s. So when these models, the climate models, were designed, they were designed, that, uh, they were designed not including geoengineering programs. And we believe that's the biggest factor in our changing climate. So most people realize, especially us here in California, that our weather has been changing, that we're, we're having a massive drought. But if you go into the Midwest, 
they're getting all. Oh, we're floods. flooding. We're flooding like crazy. My daughter lost her townhouse a month ago from floods. Exactly. So if you go up to the Arctic, and I'll explain what's happening, it's very warm up there. So yes, people are saying, yeah, of course, there's you know there's global warming. But if you're on the East Coast, it's very cold. And what they're doing, George, and what we explained in the first film. Through geoengineering, they have the ability to put the aerosols, which primarily are heavy metals, looks like it could be cold fly ash, at least in some of the programs. Anyways, they put these metals into the atmosphere. And through HARP and other HARP-like technologies, ionospheric heaters, they have the ability to heat up uh, areas of the Pacific. So what we've been seeing outside of California for the past couple of years, the jet stream, which should be coming right into California, bringing in precipitation, and uh, bringing in normal weather patterns, it's getting diverted because it hits the bubble. Uh, When they heat that up, of course, it creates a bubble, and the jet stream hits it, and it diverts north. So it brings all that warm temperature, all that warm uh, weather, and all that precipitation into the Arctic region, and it warms it, and it starts melting the ice. But, of course, any stream, once you block it, like a river or a stream, it's going to want to correct itself, and it does, and it brings all that uh, cold weather back into the Midwest and the East Coast, and that's why California has been getting droughted out, and that's why the Midwest and the East Coast has had an abundance of rain, very cold summers, and very cold weather. That is the climate change that is going on. Now, my first question when I heard about this, it was why would somebody want to do this? You know, it didn't make sense to me until we looked at California and some of the political objectives, which appear to be uh, right now being met. And and some of those are, are uh, related to Agenda 2130. We interviewed Rosa Corey, uh, who's been on your show, and, and she was a tremendous... Yeah, she's uh, very good. Yeah, and Patrick Wood uh, did just a wonderful job. What's happening in California, there's a water issue. And because of the drought, which no question about it was geoengineering, uh, Jerry Brown uh, called for a state of emergency here in California. And what that state of emergency does, it gives him the ability through eminent domain to take property, to take land, uh, and it also gives him the ability to allocate water from small farmers who have had water trusts and they have water rights. What's being done is they're diverting water away from them, giving it to big corporate ags. And, of course, where that relates to Agenda 21, the farmers that don't have water end up drying up and they have to sell their farms. And there are corporations that come in for pennies on the dollar, and they take that land, and they push the farmers into cities. And what it does, it consolidates control not only over the land, but also over the water. And what it's doing now in California, California has a rate plan for water that is three tiers. So if somebody cuts back and they stay below what they've been using, uh, they have probably no uh, increase in their water rates. However, if they use more, or continue to use the same amount that they've had, their water rates go up considerably. And when you consolidate power, when big corporate uh, interests take over the water, they can make it the next oil, and that's what they're doing. They're consolidating uh, the ownership of the water, controlling it, and jacking up the rates. And water is the next oil. They're moving forward. So this drought has been a a very effective tool for achieving uh, a lot of uh, land opportunities for, for big corporations and then also taking control over the water. And when it moves past California, which it will, we're going to be seeing this everywhere. And as a matter of fact, we are. So uh, geoengineering gives tremendous leverage over many different systems on the planet. Uh, In terms of agriculture, geoengineering creates what's called abiotic stress. Uh, Abiotic stress is anything that will stress the soil. It's uh, it's fungal overgrowth, too much moisture, Uh, It's drought conditions, um, uh, heavy metal contamination. So these programs literally destroy the soils uh, around the world. Well, when the crops, especially organic crops, start to fail, which they are, the the farm that I stay on uh, in Maui, we've had a 50% decline in our ability to get yields. What they do, Monsanto comes in, they've developed a a genetically modified abiotic stress-resistant seed that will grow in this new environment. George, what they're doing uh, well, they're doing a whole lot. One of the things that they're doing, they're taking over agriculture, our forests, through death and destruction, through these programs. And when nature dies, when nature dies, these corporations redesign the seed that will grow in this new environment. And what this is, it's this new system. It's the corporate system. It's what the Bible calls the Antichrist system. And if you destroy something and come in with a redesigned seed, that makes the designer of that seed what? Makes them the author of life. 
and then they can dictate, they can mandate where those seeds go, who pays oh, for of them, course. and that, what they do. I mean, it's, it's a grand plan that on a corporate level, you can make a lot of money if it works. But is it the right thing to do? It's, it's taking over nature. It's pushing God out of the equation. Well, and you know what happens when you do that, Michael. It's not a good idea. Some of the chemicals that people are finding, and you mentioned this briefly uh, at the uh, first half, aluminum, but you're finding barium. And what do these chemicals do? Oh, geez. Well, aluminum, normally, it's, it's, in, in, it, it's a very abundant metal, however, not in free form. So aluminum, uh, geoengineers state aluminum is a very effective metal to put up into our sky with the idea of reflecting sunlight back into space. Aluminum is lightweight, and it has, I think, eight times the the radiative effect as opposed to sulfur, which was the initial uh, contaminant or, should I say, pollution that that they were considering putting into our skies. Um, It's also a very effective conductor. So the idea is, of course, blocking our sun and reflecting sunlight back into space and cooling the planet. Um, That idea is not uh, proven, however, while... We know aluminum or putting the aerosols in the sky, you'll notice some, some days when they start spraying. It's a nice sunny day. It's about 80 degrees. And then you'll see the planes back and forth, back and forth. The temperature will drop about 7 degrees. However, at night, those aerosols stay in our sky and they trap heat. So it actually warms the planet. Um, and there are a number of studies that state that. So uh, what it's doing, it's, it's creating the climate change. It's creating, whether it's warming or cooling, whatever it's doing in regional areas. And because of that, it's impossible to really determine what's going on in terms of uh, temperature in, in our planet. So uh, in, in the geoengineering movement, there's been a lot of division over this issue of global warming. People are arguing whether it's warming or cooling. And uh, supporting the warming theory does nothing but support the very legislation, which is aimed at legalizing geoengineering. So we don't uh, promote that and we don't support that. Uh, however, it's, it's impossible. It's literally impossible. And I'll ask the audience tonight, please tell me with ongoing geoengineering programs, how anybody can determine whether the planet's warming or cooling. And with that, is it prudent to move forward with giving up our power, our control, our national boundaries, even uh, our privacy in our own homes, and uh, a whole lot more, which hopefully we'll get into based on this very principle. And that's the principle that we're moving on uh, with. But in terms of uh, barium, you had asked what barium does. It's very toxic. Um, It uh, it increases blood pressure, weakens our immune system. Um, People have tested uh, in Arizona and actually around the world uh, had their blood tested and their hair tested. They're finding, again, thousands of times the normal amounts of aluminum, barium, strontium, and other metals that are related to coal fly ash. So it appears just like what we had with fluoride being a waste product, where was it put? It was put into the water. It appears that coal fly ash is a very effective residue from burning coal, which is mandated to be captured in precipitators. So it's not allowed to go up into the smoke stack, but it does have very high amounts of aluminum, barium, strontium, lead, all of these things uh, that I was wondering when we initially took the test. In both what in the world and why in the world are they spraying, we looked at aluminum, barium, and strontium only, but we're finding things such as arsenic and and many other things. And now Dr. Uh, Herndon has uh, performed a number of rain tests uh, from certain regions, and he has found uh, the footprint or the fingerprint of coal fly ash, which, again, is a very effective uh, residue to put up in our sky for geoengineering purposes but it's devastating for human health. Michael, is this also being used for some kind of unconventional warfare? We know that there's going to be battles over water and things, food. That's going to happen. But are they doing this to learn how to destroy nations? Oh, that's been done for years. I mean, we we covered that in in Why in the World. And yes, weather control, it's the perfect weapon. And yes, we had, like in Vietnam, uh, Project Popeye. 13 feet of rain in less than an hour. 13 feet? I believe it was 13 feet. My God. And that destroyed the Vietnamese supply line, literally destroyed it. Um, We've seen different programs during the Johnson administration where they've actually helped certain regions um, uh, get rain. However, it is the perfect weapon because if you can destabilize a country, if you can uh, destroy through, whether it's through droughts, floods, if you can move water away, as we're seeing in California, you can literally uh, uh, 
destroy the food supply of a nation and really create a lot of uh, a lot of uh, internal problems. You, in, in a couple of months, you'll see rioting, other things in the nation. So it's a very effective weapon. And I remember back, George, uh, during the Iraq War, and uh, somebody said to me, and I think I was in church, and they said, "Wow, can you believe God? God is on the side of the U.S. government because hmm. right before they invaded Iraq." The Iraqi army was destroyed with these tremendous sandstorms, and they couldn't get their flights off of the ground. And I said, yeah, you know, God must be on the side of the U.S. Now knowing that this technology has been around for years and it's very yeah. effective in warfare purposes, it's very clear to me. Or, you know, it's, it's very uh, – it leads me to question. It sounds like was- Sodom and Gomorrah all, all over again, doesn't it? There you go. Stay with us, Michael. We're at the top of the hour, but we're going to come back and talk more about your latest work, Unconventional Gray, and we'll take phone calls. So if you think you see chemtrails up there, why don't you check in with us, too? Well, a Los Angeles-bound airlines, American Airlines, 188 people aboard flying from London to Los Angeles, had to turn around and go back. Six people got sick on the plane including a flight attendant who merely fainted and passed out. They don't know what happened, but they got back okay. But six people strangely ill. That's strange all by itself. They checked the plane. They said they didn't find anything. We're going to come back in a moment with our special guest, Michael Murphy, and your phone calls as we talk about unconventional gray chemtrails on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Michael Murphy with us. We'll get to your calls in just a second as they continue to pile up. I did get an email, Michael, from someone who said, George, to answer your question about why you folks can't find the pilots, what if all these planes now are drones? There are no pilots. You know what? That's that's a great question. And I think very much of a reality, you know, in certain capacities. So, uh, yes, that's a very, again, valid question. And that's something that we're considering. That's very possible indeed. And where would they be taking off from, in your opinion? Oh, I, I think uh, bases around the world. Um, these programs now are in all regions. So, uh, again, this is something that is, is – these are the biggest programs in world history, no question about it. So uh, various uh, airports – And I think there are various uh, governments and corporations involved with this. One thing is for sure, the aerosols are there. The geoengineering is occurring. Our skies are changing. They've just changed uh, dramatically. So we're moving forward uh, in a legal and legislative capacity, and uh, we are going to get these programs stopped, no question about it. And uh, then we'll determine what planet is doing in terms of warming is it warming is it cooling and i think that's a very effective approach because it again is a message uh, of unity so uh to support this project which george i don't think i said uh our website is unconventionalgray.com and we're also we also have details about Good. the lawsuit that we're initiating so unconventionalgray.com thanks and some people think oh there's nothing we can do to stop this that's not true is it George, that is the biggest lie. And yes, these programs are huge, um, but what can we not do? Once we're aware of this, then we can can share information, and I think that's critical. But we also have to look at the season that we're in. And right now, we do. We have a team, a, a, a legal team that is investigating how to move forward in a court of law, uh, which, again, addresses the flawed climate models and this global government that's being formed to remove our rights, to remove our freedoms, to bring in all of these taxes, all of these changes uh, in our lives. So this thing is huge, but again, it's all resting uh, on this issue that geoengineering is the key to. Because without geoengineering, we're confident that that a lot of this climate change uh, would not be occurring. But again, once we stop geoengineering, we can see. So we don't even get into that argument. And and, uh, we feel, again, this is the only way to address this. If we do not address this legally or legislatively and only hand out flyers, this legislation will be matured. Uh, There's a five-year period of implementation. And once that goes out of the United States or other jurisdictions, who do you go to? Well, you go to, what is it, the, the tribunals that are formed by the TPP, the TPIP, those are formed by the corporations, and those are legally binding. Um, so there are a couple of backdoors and loopholes related uh, to this ch- climate change uh, agreement, and there's been a little bit of argument whether it's binding or non-binding. 
the reality of it is it's partially binding, not in all areas, but the TPP is legally binding. And what it does, it gives the corporations the ability to sue municipalities if they interfere with the corporation's profitability. Geoengineering programs are very profitable. And, uh, again, so many people are saying, well, the Senate would never ratify this. Um, 95% of all international uh, agreements have been signed by executive order. They are calling climate change a national security threat here in the United States. Um, this thing is moving forward. It's moving forward very quickly. As a matter of fact, we have uh, carbon taxes here in California, and 500 new climate laws came into effect in 2015. These were all UN-based, and again, they were all based on climate models that state CO2 is the cause of our changing climate, which completely left out uh, the fact that geoengineering is a huge factor, probably the biggest factor in our changing climate. So uh, part of the film, Unconventional Grave, we went to, myself and a bunch of activists, we went to Paris, France in the summer. It was the precursor for the COP21 meeting. And really with the agenda of asking the scientists, hey, what, you know, what are the risks of your legislation, uh, your steps that you're taking now in terms of forming a, a carbon dictatorship? a world government that, that's based on carbon, where we all have to be taxed on carbon, where, uh, again, uh, state boundaries are, are circumvented, the state laws are not respected. Um, and nobody could answer that question. But what we really also went in there to ask, are you considering geoengineering in, in your models and what does that mean? And we got the same answer from every scientist. Well, it means the models are flawed. And again, you can't move forward with all of these changes, including the legalization of geoengineering, and that's really our primary concern, uh, until the models are 100% accurate. So there is no consensus, even though we're told there is, in the scientific community. And uh, again, you have to look at geoengineering's role in this changing climate. So, you know, a lot of this, it's the problem, reaction, solution. Create the climate change, get a population around the world to support your methods uh, of under the guise of saving the planet, but they're the ones that are destroying it, and get support for all of these monetary and political changes that are not in the best interest uh, of people. I mean, we're looking at some, some real Orwellian changes here with the smart meters. We, we really went into this in unconventional gray, and if, there are a lot of people demanding that, that our legislators do more to address this issue. I really don't think that they're giving our legislators the power to spray them with toxic chemicals without their input and without their input of their legislators. And we really have to take a look at where this is going, and it's not going into a good place. So it's critical that we address, again, the legal and legislative. And I know I keep on repeating this, George, but it, it's absolutely essential to get geoengineering stopped. And I want to live, and I know a bunch of other people, want to live in a planet where we can breathe fresh air, where we can grow natural no doubt. food, and where we do not have to submit to five people that want to demand and dictate what we do, we want to live free. And, and this issue is essential for that. All right, let's go to the phones now. Shane in New Orleans to get us started. Hey, Shane, go ahead. Good evening, gentlemen. I hope you both are doing well. Yes, sir. Uh, George, I just want to thank you. Uh, first time I got to talk to you uh, since I've been listening about oh, 2002. Well, and thank you. love the show. And uh, I love what you guys do for people and you and the crew. Thanks. But uh, to, to back up Michael's uh, research, um, I lived in New Orleans my entire life, and I evacuated for Katrina. Well, when we came back, my father and I were outside every single day on top of all of our friends and family groups for a good six months straight. And so I got to see these, these chemtrails. Sometimes it looked like a checkerboard in the sky. And I got to be thinking, I was like, well, you cannot, you know, blame that on regular aircraft contrails because no one's flying into New Orleans because there's nothing to fly into. If you're going to come back, you're going to come back in your car, and there's no one to fly out of this area because we're all gone. So there's no reason to have all these planes flying all over us. It's tapered off considerably since, uh, maybe two or, or three a day, sometimes you know, not even all, but hmm. so strange – for a good six months afterwards, the sky was littered with them. Yeah. All that happens. Go ahead, uh, Michael. It, it does happen. And not only are our skies being littered uh, in the Pacific, and what we're doing or planning on doing in two weeks, we have what 
these aerosol explosions. And we've been watching uh, satellite and various infrared imagery, and we see these uh, big clouds being formed from source points. And we know what the unnatural clouds look like. They look like this cotton candy being pulled. And living in Hawaii, we can predict when the unnatural clouds will be coming over us. And uh, we do believe it's, these are ship-based aerosols, something that geoengineers have spoken about many times. Uh, so we're taking an airplane, we're taking a crew up to test the aerosols uh, with the goals of flying over, uh, getting, uh, filming their uh, cloud generation, if you would, and then testing that cloud generation. And right now we have this argument. It's the, uh, our legislators, many of them anyways, in our scientific community, they're stating what we're seeing in, in the sky is simply condensation trails. Uh, and there's no geoengineering that's occurring. In these programs, it's very effective and very important that we fly in, that we get the aerosol tests and get positive results. And first of all, we can prove them wrong and then move forward legally. But also, uh, it takes away their plausible deniability. And now it's time for action. It's time for action once we have this conclusive proof. So there's going to be no ducking out of this issue, and we're moving into into a new era. And, and again, I can't state how critical it is. While, yes, we need to be aware of these programs, what they're doing, the toxic effects, and especially to protect ourselves, hopefully we can talk about this. But right now, if, again, we fail to take the legal and legislative steps that we've discussed, I feel strongly that our hands will be tied and we will not be able to do anything in the future because it will be out of our jurisdiction. And that's where this thing is going. So right now, we have a very short time, but again, we're, for the first time, we have a legal team, uh, and, and we have a team right now, uh, just an incredible cast uh, of people that, that are uh, in the film. We do need resources to complete this, so go to unconventionalgray.com, become a funding angel, um, and, and help put an end to these programs uh, we're ready to do it. So thank you very much for, for your input. Really appreciate, appreciate that. that, Shane, and thanks for listening. Gordon in Las Vegas, welcome to the show, Gordon. Go ahead. Hey, George, great to talk to you. I can't believe I'm talking to Michael Murphy on my first call. Uh, he's one of the best. You know, um, I just got a question for you. And um, now we all know that the global economy is in serious trouble. If you tie in a catastrophic grain failure with a global economic collapse. My question is, how many people will starve to death? How many uh, commercial livestock will mm. starve to death? Who goes around and picks up all the dead bodies? And is this a format for depopulation of the planet? All great questions, Michael. I'm going to answer that question with a statement that Scott Stevens made and we used in our marketing. If you control the weather, you control the planet. That's it's right. that simple. We're not only talking about populations. We are. We're talking about uh, eating. And if you drought out a nation like we've had uh, in Africa, in some of the underdeveloped countries, yes, people are starving. This technology, this technology is there. It's operational. And, yes, it is droughting out and destroying food supplies, and people are dying from this. This is very, very serious. These are attacks on nature and humanity, and because of that, certain interests, corporate and also uh, certain global elite who feel strongly that the population needs to be depopulated, they're moving forward because this fulfills their many objectives. And it goes beyond monetary. It goes beyond global governance. And, and I think it, it attacks the very thing that's the most important thing on our planet. That's life. Do that's you life. think this is a sinister plan to control the world's population it's related there's no question about it people are dying so you know we have people like the Rockefellers, the rothschilds those are just to name a few there are some people that have a lot of power and they feel very strongly that the world is overpopulated um and because of that they do they have the ability and power especially through these programs to manipulate and decrease the population so uh it definitely is um, and that's debatable whether these programs are that. These programs do many things on, on many different levels. Some of, George, what I won't even touch some of the agendas because I don't think it's prudent in terms of what our objectives are to move forward in stopping these programs. But, yes, these programs are they're, they're not only destroying human life. Uh, this is ecosystem collapse. This is species extinction 
which is going on at an alarming rate, and that could all be reversed. Let's go to Lex in Hamilton, Ontario, on our Skype line. Lex, go ahead, sir. Hi, guys. Hi, Lex. I am I, I am just so excited that this fella is doing what he's doing because I tried to do the same thing a couple of years ago. And if you're short of pilots to want to go up there and take some tests, like uh, just get a hold of the fellas at 9-11 Truth, pilots for 9-11 Truth. There'll be some pilots there that'll do what you need. Now, uh, the one problem I had here uh, when I tried to rent a, a, a small jet to go up and fly through a chemtrail, uh, the pilots here are uh, interested, but they are afraid of cockpit contamination because all aircraft uh, that, that uh, jet engines uh, have an air, air filter system mm. that goes into the cabin. Sucks yeah, it right in. Needs. Yeah, so they don't want to go through the, the, the chemtrail. Now, the National Research Council of Canada has a special aircraft, a jet, a small air jet type aircraft with special attachments on the exterior that will take the samples. However, uh, going again, the air goes into the cabin. So uh, uh, nowadays, I think there are some planes that are being built uh, soon that will uh, change that air air, air uh, dimension thing. Uh, but. But anyways, uh, uh, yeah, contact uh, pilots for 9-11 Truth. There'll be some pilots there that'll do your flying for you if you have an aircraft uh, uh, to use. That's another problem. Uh, what what lease company will give you an aircraft to go up there and do what you do, and then they're going to have to check out the pilots, et cetera, et cetera. But these guys, I know, um, I don't know them personally, but I am always in contact with them and reading what they do. And uh, you'll find your pilots at Pilots for 9-11 Truth. They're, p- they're pretty gutsy. Hey, thank you, Lex. Appreciate that. Well, that's a possibility if you ever want to go up there and test the stuff, Michael. We're, we're, we're in the process. So we've already gone up and we're scheduled. Uh, we don't have the date, but in about two weeks we're planning on going into Maui. So we did receive uh, one donation, which gave us enough. We joke around. We say, yeah, we have finally have our gas money, kind of like we're hitchhiking. But we do have enough to go up for one test. Um, it's important that we do a multitude uh, of tests because of the many variables that we have. And, and bottom line, we're in it to win it. We're just not going up there to fly around. We're not going into court, just going to court to, to spread awareness. We're going in with very specific objectives. And, and the reason is this, our time is very short, and they're moving forward with legislation. So we have to go for the jug. Um, we're, we're, we plan, and you can go onto the website, Unconventional Gray, Click on the side, Lawsuit. That will bring you to our lawsuit page. Now, we're not uh, releasing much information, but enough to give uh, our viewers and our supporters an idea in terms of what, uh, what approach that we're taking. And, and there have been some other ideas for lawsuits, and you know we, we commend people for moving forward in that capacity, but you have to look at what's happening geopolitically, and you have to file the lawsuit accordingly. And again, there, there's only a certain number of chances that we can get this into the courtroom before they will start throwing out cases before they're even filed. And that is why we, uh, we are looking to fund our team uh, of attorneys um, for research. We need a well-funded team. Bottom line, the people who we're battling against, they're well-funded. Um, they have all of their needs met. They're working with the best computers and, and the best systems. This is going to be a battle, and, and our team needs to be on the same stage as them. So, yes, we're looking for uh, an initial uh, uh, funding strategy, which we outlined um, on the website. So, again, unconventionalgray.com. But then we're moving into four phases. And uh, it's critical that we do this um, and are well-funded and have the resources to compete or, should I say, take on those who will be defending these crimes against nature and humanity. All right. We will be back in a moment with your final calls on Coast to Coast Day. Welcome back with Michael Murphy, his new documentary, of course, Unconventional Gray. Michael, most people will say that uh, in the morning the skies seem clear, and then by uh, mid-afternoon they're all patchy, foggy, tic-tac-toes and everything. Do you think that that's when the spraying occurs sometime in the mid-afternoon? You know, it used to. Um, Today we see it in the night, so in the morning, after studying the, the trails and what they turn into, uh, a lot of us have become have become very effective at at noticing what's artificial, and it's most uh, of what's up in the sky. So you know, there's no telling anymore. And in a lot of it, you know, as we have discussed, is related to weather control, climate change, um, diverting jet streams, and and so forth. So 
Um, Scott Stevens, you know, I spoke with him, uh, uh, weatherman who, who was in our last film. I mm-hmm. asked him, how much of Good a man. guy in weather is natural? He said, none. None? None. Huh. He said, he said, Were you none. surprised by that? Um, at, at the time, you know, when that was back in, in 2012. And, and, of course, there are natural systems, so they're working with natural systems to produce desired effects, wherever that might be. Um, at the time, my mouth kind of opened. I, I didn't really believe him, but now I'm looking at, at the weather patterns. And when we have a storm front coming in, that's when they start trailing. That's when they start trailing. Or a powerful storm, uh, like in Arizona, the monsoons are getting destroyed. They're seeding the tops of the monsoons almost on a daily basis. So, you know, right now there, there's so much going on, and there's so much that can be achieved through these programs, especially relating to this climate change agenda, that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely, they have their hand in, the, the corporations and governments, in, in most of our weather uh, because of the power that it, that it gives. So uh, today I'm not surprised back then I was. Let's go to Baltimore. Tom's with us on Coast to Coast on the wild card line. Hi, Tom. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning. Uh, by the way, when I was on hold, uh, I heard the Coast to Coast Insider commercial. Yeah. Been an insider since its inception. Well, it thank you. Bargain. Absolutely. It's 15 cents a day. You can't beat it. And I have to say very quickly, George, the young lady, very professional, who is screening for Tommy. Gina. Uh, she's been doing that for a couple years, right? Ladies? Yeah, she sure has. And I've gotten her, I think, at least three times. You can't put a price tag on her, George. She's one of the most professional, kindest, nicest persons that I've dealt with. And I've dealt, I'm dealt. i retired now, but I, I dealt with people my entire career. So please know that and let whoever um, uh, can give her a rave and keep her um, <laughs> retained, let them know that as well. She is, she is blushing as you speak, Tom. Well, it's all true. Huh. I'm a cop, so I wouldn't lie to you. Thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Murphy, um, thank you. Kudos to you for the work you're doing on the um, the chemtrails this spring. I think it's one of the, well, possibly one of the most dangerous things uh, for our health. And I think uh, you're extending that into tackling uh, global warming is excellent as well. I think that may be one of the most detrimental things to our wallet if uh, they get their way in uh, taxing us for carbon credits and such. What I did want to ask you, though, when you uh, are taking this and applying it to global warming, uh, how rigidly have you stuck with the scientific method in determining that there is a causal connection? You know what? Very close. And and I've cross-referenced this with scientists. And anytime you have a model, what you put in and what you get out needs to be accurate. So I compare this issue in the models, uh, the models being, let's say if you're in your home and you turn the heat up to 100 degrees, would it be prudent to say, oh my God, it's getting hot outside? It might be getting hot outside. It could be getting cold outside. You don't know until you turn off the heat. That heat being geoengineering, and that's what we have. We have regional displacements of weather systems, of jet streams, and thus temperatures. And that's why we're getting the warming in the Arctic, the sub-zero weather you know, down in, in the south uh, part of uh, America in the southern states. You cannot get an accurate temperature reading until the heating or cooling factor is changed and the Earth is able to, uh, to rebound that back to its natural state. And at that time, then you can. But you know, due to the fact that the very entities who benefit from this are the ones that that are geoengineering, and they're aware of this. They're they're not, you know, blind on this. This is about money. It's about power. It's about control. It's about global domination. It's about controlling you in your home. It's about controlling everything that every people do in this world. It's a new system. It's a carbon-based system. It is a carbon-based economy. It's a complete transformation. And if people were even aware of, of what we're looking at, and, and I'm talking about you might be, we all are going to have to be capped unless you have money and you have the ability to trade carbon credits. All of our energy sources, all of what we do is based on, on carbon. And you might only be able to drive $10 or 10 miles a day. And now in, in Oregon, they're actually monitoring people and, and there's a tax, a mileage tax. And you, you will be capped. I don't know how much, but you might only be able to drive 70 miles per week. Let's say if you drive, if you work 50 miles away, what's that going to mean? And how much are you going to be taxed each mile after? Or how much will you be penalized? 
You know, these are some real good questions that the people demanding that our legislators do more are not asking. What about in your home? Let's say if you leave a light on. We have smart meters that monitor everything that we do in our home. Let's say if you leave a light on, you go to work. Your smart meter detects that. You could get a $200 fine for leaving that light on. I mean, these things are pretty severe. And then let's say these smart meters can measure everything. We uh, have interviewed uh, a lot of people uh, in relation to this. Uh, uh, they have the ability to determine what appliances we're using. And this, again, is a whole new green-based uh, economy that's coming in and green-based appliances. And they will be mandating against our will. They will be telling us what products to buy, when we can use them, and how we can use them. And let's say you use your vacuum cleaner in five years. We're looking at a five-year planned implementation, and it's not uh, registered green you could get a fine for that. This is what corporations love because through these climate agreements and what the goal of these climate agreements uh, are doing is to really create a dictatorship. So the corporations working with governments to determine what you do, what you buy, when you use everything, they love it because you will not have a choice. You will be forced into many things. And this is a complete transformation of life of freedom, the way that we know things, and the clamp is coming down. And again, I can't stress, these are all predicated. Everything that we're seeing, all of these taxes on climate models that are flawed, they're fraudulent. We can prove that, and we have to stop it. And if you think these things are bad, I don't want geoengineering. And I'm certainly not going to accept geoengineering based on climate models that said the planet's warming when I know and when the scientists know it's impossible to determine whether it's warming or cooling. So it's very critical that, that uh, we test positives, at least uh, in our atmosphere tests. We have rain tests from around the world, but this is a court of law, so we have to be very specific. So we're going up in the airplanes. And proving geoengineering is happening in this capacity is, act is absolutely critical. But, you know, we looked at, and we're still looking at different ways within this lawsuit. You know, we're looking at ways to, to sue the EPA for failure to report. But what is that going to do to the geoengineering agenda? Because, again, their geoengineering is critical before we take action that they get these programs legalized. So any other lawsuit may get this, you know, in, into the public eye. Uh, but I think, again, it's critical that we address uh, climate agreements and the flawed climate models in order to get these in injunctions. And, and, again, we're not, we're not saying the planet's not warming or not cooling. We're not even arguing that. And, and that's the beauty of it because what it does, it gives incentives for those who, who are really – pushing this climate change agenda and the and global warming issue, we can partner with them to say, let's move forward in stopping geoengineering together collectively for the planet. Let's partner. And that's what our message is. And this is the, the, for the first time in the history of this world, we now have an issue that impacts each and every one of us in, in a very major way. But, but with that problem, with that is issue, we have an issue that can unite us, and it will and it is. And this is the transformation, and this is the issue that we need to restore our planet, to restore our, our political system that is fraudulent, that is corrupt, relating to this issue. And, and it's a very slippery slope. There's a lot of power here, but we have truth. And with the right support and with the right partnerships, we will be successful. And this is the biggest agenda, period, on the history of the planet, and we're all impacted by it, and we have to change this. There's no choice. We have to move forward in changing this. And uh, I'm very excited about the way that we're going uh, in, in the plans that we have. Uh, so you can go to unconventionalgray.com. Uh, please pre-order a DVD that will give us resources or become an angel uh, to complete the project and to get, up, uh, in, uh, get enough funds for the aerosol uh, test. And then uh, we have some funding objectives for the lawsuit. So click on that website, learn more about it. But again, we need to come together to stop these programs, and we will. Let's go to Reddy in California. Hello, Mark. Welcome to the program. Go ahead, Hi, Mark. Hi, Michael. Hi. You know, I, I had a question, and I'm going to sort of play devil's advocate here for a moment, but have you ever stopped to consider that maybe there's a good reason uh, for the chemtrails? Now, let me explain. George, you've done an excellent job of pointing out the vulnerability of the grid to an EMP and that kind of an attack, mm -hmm. but it's a fact that if you put a stratospheric layer of conductive metal particles in the atmosphere, and there is a nuclear explosion above that, that it should help to shield the grid against that kind of an EMP. So there's one possibility. Another might, uh, you know, and I know that it's, 
it's uh, it's attractive, it's it's entertaining to consider all these nefarious plots, Agenda 21 and so forth, you know, population control and these sorts of things. But we know for a fact that there's now a kind of optical stealth that's being adapted throughout the defense industry, not just our country but other countries. And so if you've got planes now that, that no longer have a thermal signature, no longer have a uh, supersonic footprint because they're traveling at lower speeds, but they're even invisible to the eye, one of the ways that you could see them is by putting particles into the air, broadcast a microwave signal that resonates those little nanoparticles and heats them up, and anything that's flying through that is going to punch a hole that you'll be able to see on a scanner that shows where the nanoparticles are not because they've been displaced by the flight of the aircraft. So this might be, I mean, if you consider it as a possible overarching national security interest, why they're doing this and why they're neglecting all the other environmental Considerations. I mean, have you ever looked at those possibilities? Have you ever thought about those possibilities? Absolutely, and I'm glad that, that you brought that up because there are a number of things that can be achieved um, through these programs, um, and some that might be under the guise of protecting, but, you know, we really have to look at society in a different way. This is aluminum. This is barium. People are dying from this, and under the guise of national security, we have to put poisons in your sky to protect you. Um, there's a better way. There's a humanitarian way. Our system is broken. If we're poisoning people to protect them, we have to look at the fundamental way we're governing. And that's where the issue is. That's where the issue is. We have to move forward, the planet moving forward in this type of structure, in this model, is not sustainable. Where we live in a planet where perhaps they are. Some of these programs could be to protect the planet, but we know for a fact, there's no question about it, these programs are designed to manipulate our weather. They are designed to change the temperature of the planet. So a lot is being achieved through this. But because of that, because of that, that's a political issue. There are a lot of geopolitical implications, and I'm not willing to be poisoned uh, every day because uh, the U.S. might have uh, done some military exercises and might be be threatened in some capacity. We're in a season today. What about those who spray? They breathe the air too, Michael. They, they do. And, and you know, there, I think there are a couple of levels, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because it comes up every time. And there are people who, who do their job. They do what they're told. Um, and uh, those are the people probably, if there are pilots anymore, but the people loading the jets. And, uh, you know, they, a lot of people do their work. They do what they're told and they keep their job without questioning. But we do without question. We have people who are aware of what this is doing, aware that it's, it's causing death and destruction. But as geoengineer David Keith said, he, he said geoengineering gives man godlike power. And I've never chased godlike power. George, maybe you did a couple of times. I doubt it. But I know a few people who did. It wasn't as big as a rush. And I'm, I'm joking around a little bit. But uh, huh. that godlike power must be a hell of a rush. And you know, we have, we have examples because, yes, these people are breathing in these metals. I'm sure they're detoxing them and, and taking good care of their health because they know what's in it. But we have examples every single day of people using drugs, of people doing things, adrenaline junkies, that, that are not in the best interest of their health for the rush. So how much bigger is a god like rush and it, all of this power? And, and you can even relate it to a businessman. We have people dying of heart attacks left and right here in America and other countries because they wanted to overwork and gain money. They, they were pursuing money and power, and I think it's the, the, the same thing. I really do. Would you take some time? Uh, we may take one more call. I'm not sure if we have time, but mention your websites and where they can get your DVDs. Of course. Um, unconventionalgray.com, and uh, we absolutely need support to complete the aerosol collection project and to complete the project. So go to the website. Please uh, pre-order a DVD. Uh, we should be complete. We're expecting in April or May, uh, hopefully. And uh, you can also go to, uh, to see my second multi-award winning film. It won 14 uh, awards, and that's why in the world are they spraying.com. And then we also have geoengineeringactionnetwork.org. That has details uh, about the strategy that we're developing for the lawsuit. And uh, one more, if I could. I know I have a lot of websites. Hey, it's your moment. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, George. And uh, the Coalition Against Geoengineering, and I formed that with uh, G. Edward Griffin. We've had some oh, he's a good guy. Isn't he? Tell him hi for me. 
Yeah, he, he's wonderful. So uh, we've had some incredible volunteers come in and really develop that website. So I want to shout out to them and, and thank them for, for all of their support. What drives you, Michael? 30 seconds. Jeez. You know, George, it's it's the... It's the... 20. <laughs> a lot. Um, it, it's the fact that if nobody does this, of what we're looking at. Um, this this is my, my desire for life and my service to, to humanity. So, you know, I wake up. It's not the funnest job in the world. It has to be done. And, and it's my love for humanity. Somebody's got to do it, right? Yeah. All right, Michael. Thank you so much. Good work. And, of course, you are always welcome on Coast to Coast.